Hello, my name is Wei Li and I'm part of the Business and Finance Group. Today, we have a distinguished alumnus here, Muzava Khan, who has kindly volunteered his time. He has worked in many financial institutions such as the Man Group, Citibank and Barclays and is here to help provide us valuable advice on how to get into the finance industry, advice on CV and cover letters as well as tips of uh, pitfalls to avoid during the application process. Muzafa, considering how hard it is to get into the finance industry, what advice would you give an aspiring student who wants to enter the industry to make the best use of his university experience? So traditionally, students look at their career at the university in two extreme ways. One is they arrive here and they want to make the most out of the student experience, which is the socializing, the academics, as well as the other extracurricular activities that a university allows you to indulge in. Or they come in here and they are extremely focused on, I have to get a job, my university is my passport to getting that job, so how do I basically make sure that every moment I'm here, I am gearing myself up to be the perfect candidate for university. I think that there is wisdom in thinking about amalgamating those approaches. And what actually you do is say, how can I make university fun for myself and yet still have the experience and the CV that will get me a job in probably one of the most competitive industries in the world. So for me, there are four ways of combining the two experiences. And underlying all of them is a simple principle. And that is that whatever you do at university, do it efficiently. Now that sounds very odd when you think about socializing, right? Is that how do you socialize efficiently? But stay with me and I'll go through it. Sure. So the first thing is in academia. One of the things that we spend a lot of time working with students is to say how can they gear up to the higher level of demands academically that a university requires vis-a-vis -a, -vis a high school. So what I do is I break it down into three core components. Number one is how do you filter the huge amount of information that a university gives you most efficiently? Number two, how do you then process that information as deeply as when you were a young student? And number three, how do you reproduce that information to the satisfaction of the university's examining boards? Most students don't think about learning efficiently. They think about working as hard as possible to get to an end result, rather than saying, what would be the most efficient way to get to that end? So that's the first thing we examine. How do you help you get a high degree in the most efficient way? Well, when you look at these three core components, you realize that the best way of learning how to learn is actually getting the help of students the year above who have done very well. Okay? So you sit down with the students and you say, okay, what study techniques did you use that really worked for you and brought about outperformance? The beauty of data is that if you have a student who's got a first, then you know that he must or she must be doing something right. And you collect a bunch of these students and you start asking about their methods of studying of the three things we talked about, which is filtering the information, deeply absorbing it, and then reproducing it to the level that the examiners want to see. And then choose from their different methods, four, five, six of them, which one appeals to you the most. Okay? So that's the first element, efficient studying. The second element is students always complain about the fact and today, actually, at the LSE, I had one student say that it takes him eight to ten hours to complete an application form. Now, if you're doing 20 or 30 applications, that's 200 to 300 hours. That's a huge amount of time. 
given that you're working eight to ten hours a day on your studies, including homework, where are you supposed to find 300 hours in the first month, right? It's incredibly difficult. So again, what we do is something very simple. I encourage students to find people a year or two ahead of them who've got the spring internship, let's say, that they're applying for, or the summer internship they're applying for, or the graduate recruitment job they're applying for. Find the people a year ahead who've actually got those jobs and ask for help and say, could you teach me? What did you write? And how were you inspired to write the perfect answers? So someone is actually teaching you to do these things much faster rather than you from trial and error trying to find the best methodology of approaching this subject. When you actually get someone to help you, because the content will always be your own, but this is an area where it's perfectly morally and legally right to ask <laughs> advice, you know? It's like, what should I actually, how should I structure my answers in the application forms, my CVs, my covering letters, and where should I research the numeracy tests and the verbal reasoning tests and so on. In all these areas, if you get help, it's much more efficient in the same way that the reason that you're taught in class rather than <laughs> reading from books is that the teacher teaches you the best method as quickly as possible. Same idea, what you get, they teach you. You get your applications per hour down to three, three and a half hours each, and suddenly it becomes more manageable, right? So when we look at these first two strategies, we see that the underlying idea is efficiency because what we are doing is buying back time, right? Because you can't do all these things if you don't have the time. So everything is designed to minimize the time spent. Number three, students always say to me, how do we network efficiently? Yeah? And they spend a lot of time going to talks and lectures from outside employers and their representatives or famous personalities, especially at the LSE, who will come and give lectures. And then they spend time focusing on networking with these people. What they don't understand is that at the London School of Economics, you have people from some very, very diverse backgrounds. Many of them will have friends, possibly family friends, possibly people they've interacted with in their internships a year or two before. And actually, if you socialize with a lot of people at LSE, maybe they will help you with their contacts. So they will actually act as the facilitator to networking. So when you think of it that way, then socializing with LSE students, which should be enjoyable, actually starts helping you in network for your job. Yeah? So that way you're socializing, you're going out to the three tons here or the beavers retreat or you know the garrick or whatever and you're actually providing creating a dual function both you are having fun meeting people getting to know them but also they're acting as possible leads for the future so that's number three number four is the idea of taking advantage of the huge extracurricular activities that LSE provides, whether it's in sports, whether it's in clubs like, I don't know, the chess club if there is one, or, you know, name me a club, martial arts society, jiu-jitsu, whatever it is. These clubs are also the perfect places, again, to socialize and get to know people who may have the contacts that you don't. So if you are, say, doing martial arts together or playing chess together, etc., you get into a conversation, they have certain contacts, you have certain contacts, and you start sharing with each other, right? So you say, hey, I'll introduce you to someone at Morgan Stanley that I met a few days ago. And they say, oh, I'll introduce you to someone at JP Morgan that I met a few days ago. So here you are doing sports, or some other fun activity, but you're also pooling your resources together and becoming together 
more efficient networkers as a unit than you would by yourself. So these four techniques that I've just outlined, how to be more efficient studying through asking older people, older students, how to actually get the perfect CV cover letter, etc. by asking them, how to use social occasions to network and offer pooling resources of each other's network, and fourthly, extracurricular activities which allow you to get closer as friends and then again pursue pooling resources together, allow us a combination of having fun while outperforming hopefully at the school. Considering how competitive the finance field is, and many people are quite selfish in the sense they keep the best contacts for themselves, how, why, how will you persuade them to share the best contacts in the group and work together as a team such that they can achieve more and get the desired job that they want rather than just working individually and keeping the best contact for themselves? So, people bring this up in the individual sessions. It's interesting that no one's ever asked me this question on camera before or bring it up in a um, setting with lots of individuals because people don't want to admit to selfishness but in individual sessions they do bring this up. So thank you for being the first person to bring this up um, in this um, setting. I tend to answer this question a little fully and from a logical perspective and I start with basic sociology, right? So if you look at human beings, the reason we have survived and dominated the planet as a species is because we collaborate, right? Yeah. Um, the reality is that on it, his own, pretty much no man on the planet would be able to live with some of the predators out there like a lion or a tiger or any of the big cats or a pack of wolves etc etc. The reason that man has survived and prospered is because he as a, spe a species has pooled his resources with other human beings. So there is actually great historical evidence to suggest and empirical data to suggest that this is the right way to go. Right? So that's a bit about the theory and the logic behind the idea. Then actually let's look at our industry and let's look at the specifics of a student situation. In any given investment bank that you apply to, there is going to be a much larger number of applicants than there are positions, right? This will happen regardless of whether the person you're going to pull the resources with is there or not, right? So if we just for a second thought about it mathematically, let us say that the ratio of applicants to jobs in investment bank just conservatively is something close to a hundred applicants to a job. It's a lot more than that but let's just use a very conservative figure. So the marginal increase in your competition to 101 statistically doesn't make that sense, uh, make that much difference. Now on the other hand if two people are pooling their resources and I bring five contacts to the table and you bring five complementary contacts to the table, then both of us have doubled the number of interviews that we are likely to get because the references are supporting us, right? So we've doubled our possible reward we have increased our competition by just 1%. So you can see mathematically how it's actually always better to pool your resources with someone else, okay? When you explain this to students in that way, they get it. They get the fact that, oh, okay, it makes sense. And coincidentally, that's how the human race has operated on that cost-benefit analysis um, basis 
And that's the reason, because they've been making rational cost-benefit analyses like that, that the human race has thrived and they are more likely to thrive. But unfortunately, no one explains the value of collaboration in these terms to students, so people go back into fear and into a malignant competitiveness. Okay? That's what I call it, a malignant competitiveness, because it actually causes you harm, because it keeps away a lot of the advantages that could come to you. So whether an advantage is not received or harm is done, the underlying result is the same. Yeah? So that's, uh, that's the issue. Zafa, considering that many people enter the finance industry because of the high salary packages and remuneration, and only after a while they realize that this is a career not suited for them and hence the high attrition rate. Do you have any advice for those who are planning a career in the finance industry to what they can do to get a better understanding of it and maybe clear some misconceptions about what is it really like considering your experience in this field? So it's quite interesting. I um, just arrived back in London last week um, after having spent a week or so lecturing at Berkeley in San Francisco. And uh, I was there as a guest of the career service and uh, the Haas Business School. Um, at uh, UC Berkeley and what was so interesting about there was that most of the students were going into banking because they really liked the idea of banking because in Berkeley and at Stanford where I've um, done career uh, lecturing in the past the world is upside down so there they all feel that if they go to Silicon Valley, start up uh, a mobile app or a disruptive uh, firm, they can basically exit for $100 million plus by the time they're 26, 27. So why would they ever work in the finance industry? So for them, it really is about, well, they actually enjoy the deal making and so on that's involved in um, our industry. So I think the world has certainly changed and one of the things that I tell students is don't live in the past look at the opportunities today um, and the opportunities are not just in the finance industry even in the UK and mainland Europe tech startups are beginning to find their feet and are leading to some very nice exits for their founders. That's something to be aware of. The other area that has really become very profitable for a number of people starting out is property, especially in the UK. It's been on fire for well over 15 years. And that has led to individuals who've got into real estate and been entrepreneurial in that area to do extremely well. So in that context, I would say, you know, it's no longer the most highly remunerated industry out there. Having said that, it is still one of the most highly remunerated industry. And it is important to think about what it is that you're looking to get out of it. I know that in one-on-one -on -one sessions, and I do a thousand of them a year with students across the world, including of course LSE, um, Imperial, Berkeley, Cambridge, etc. A very large percentage do see the finance industry and investment banking in particular as a transitory experience, as something to do to build up their actual balance sheet and then exit from to something that they truly love. For those individuals, I always say be very careful because the demands of our industry are, relatively speaking, brutal. So you would be assuming 14, 
15 hour days in the workplace in IBD, you would be looking at, even in sales and trading, an average working day is unlikely to be less than 12 hours a day. You know? By any other industry standards, those are pretty tough hours to be on site. You know, this does not include travel. This does not include getting up, getting dressed in the mor morning. So literally your life for the duration of your time in the finance industry for the first few years anyway, is completely and utterly dedicated to the actual job. Now, given that it makes a lot of sense to really understand which part of the industry you're most suited to. Even if it is a transitory experience, it would be a good idea to not just take any of the divisions, but take the one for which your personality, skills, and emotional intelligence are particularly suited to. So I tend to generalize in this area, but the generalizations have some validity. Individuals who tend to be very hardworking, don't mind long hours, enjoy processes and collaboration in teamwork, tend to do better in IBD. Yeah? This is not a... It's a generalization, but it's true. There are exceptions to every rule. In the same way, individuals who are highly sociable, who enjoy talking to people, who see conversation and communication as an effective means of persuasion and get actually enjoyment out of that process tend to do better in sales. Individuals who have a more risk-taking appetite and who can handle failure well and tend to be stable emotionally around the volatility of events tend to be much better at trading. Yeah? Whereas individuals who enjoy academia, deeply digging into an asset class and the whole research process in its entirety tend to be driven to research. Yeah? Now, there are overlaps always. Some of the best traders in the world tend to be actually very good salesmen in terms of their communication skills. Some of the best salesmen tend to be people who are very calm under pressure and can execute 100 deals. So there are you know, some overlaps, but generally speaking, the broader personality types <coughs> tend to be comfortable in the areas that I described. So that's the first thing I would say to people, match your personality to the division, <coughs> rather than going just for remuneration, which most of the time I find students are wrong about. So depending on the year group and who they've talked to, they have usually inaccurate ideas about which division pays best, etc. All the front office or client facing divisions pay almost equally well if you are good at them. However, if you think, oh my God, you know, one division is going to pay really well, but you're really bad at it, this is not a very smart move if you end up getting fired, right? So there's actually wisdom in connecting the occupation as closely to your personality, even if it's a transitory experience. Considering that you spend a good portion of your time mentoring students, what do you think are the most rewarding aspects mentoring them? So, for the last six years, maybe let's go back a little bit. So I started mentoring 14 to 18 year olds in 1993. So this is my 22nd year of mentoring. And then what I did in 1999 is I started mentoring individuals in the finance industry, primarily investment banking. 
And that started in 1999 to 2003. And at that time, I was doing it completely for free because I was working at More Capital. So all the mentoring that I did was on a pro bono basis. Then I set up this social enterprise, Alchemy Ventures, which basically I mentor people in the finance industry for money. And I use that money to provide interest-free loans to poor students and also to make sure that all the mentoring that I do for university students is for free. So traveling to universities, staying in hotels, everything is free for the students. So that was the structural background to starting mentoring students, which I started in 2006, nine years ago. Since the book came out, Racing Towards Excellence, in 2009, I've tried to stick to the discipline of doing 1,000 one-on-one CV sessions and mentoring sessions with students a year um, at a number of universities, for example, this year, ranging from Berkeley, LSE, Imperial, Cambridge, Nottingham, Warwick, ex, uh, Stockholm School of Economics in Riga, and so on, and in the past to places in Portugal, Stanford in the US, and so on. So when we say that it takes up a portion of my time, it actually takes up something like 40% of my waking time throughout the year. Uh, so it's a huge commitment. Um, as well as the thousand one-on-one CV sessions, there is the speaking to about 5,000 students a year in lecture settings. So those lectures can range from 250 students at the LSE, for example, to 40 and 50 students at some of the smaller universities. And what drives me what keeps me going about this is that I find that all over the world in the last 15 or so years students are getting a harder and a worse financial deal so just to take the UK for example we were in a place 20 years ago where there were no student fees for university students. So as long as you got into a university, a university from a tuition fee perspective was completely free. And it allowed students from all walks of life to come in, choose something they were passionate at, excel, and then go out into the world. Today we are at a stage in the United Kingdom where from a standing start of zero pounds per year tuition fee to an average of around I think it's nine thousand pounds a year and in some cases even slightly more and and if it's not nine thousand pound average but nine thousand pounds has become almost the norm at many universities in the UK and on top of that there are companies who charge students for helping them with their CVs, for helping them with interviews, etc. Students are continually being charged for everything possible. I've had students tell me that they are leaving universities today um, in the UK with debts in excess of 30 and 40,000 pounds. That's an incredible burden. And what keeps me going is that I want to change the expectations of students that everyone who comes into contact with them is going to just burden them. So everything I do for students is free, university students that is. And the idea is that that will allow the students to hopefully have a different type of expectation. And hopefully one day, start organizing themselves as a lobbying group and say enough is enough that you know maybe we shouldn't be burdened any further and that we are the actual intellectual and knowledge capital of an economy 
and we are the future providers of the prosperity of that economy and we should be treated with some support and nurturing and so on. So getting that message across through my own actions by serving them without financial inducements for myself, I'm trying to create a path that others will follow and that students hopefully will demand of governments, organizations, etc. That mission drives me in this context. Considering you have devoted a good portion of your time to LSE specifically, considering it's an alma mater, how has LSE developed you considering that you did a bachelor's program here? So, the first thing LSE did for me was to develop me emotionally because I failed my first year. <laughs> so, um, having failed my first year, I had to develop um, the ability to handle failure. I'd never failed academically before. Well, actually, I remember something. I keep saying I never fa failed before, but between the age of six and nine, I used to regularly have to change schools in Pakistan because I wouldn't do my summer homework. So I guess technically I was failing those years, but I guess the more accurate statement is that from the moment I landed in England at the age of 11, I never failed academically. And then suddenly I failed my first year. So the emotion of dealing with that huge failure and then coming back and getting my degrees from LSE and so on, I think that was something that LSE gave me as a gift. It didn't feel like it at the time and certainly my parents were not happy but over time I realized that you know once that happened nothing else could really get me down. Then of course the brands that LSE gave me, you know, I have a bachelor's a BSc in economics from here. I have an MSc in development studies specializing in economics from here. Um, I have, you know, so the brand has been incredibly useful in terms of furthering my ability to create a very prosperous professional identity. Yeah. So As well as that, I think that it gave me friends who some of them have lasted my whole life. That was amazing. It gave me in the last director of the LSE, Howard Davies, a friend, but more importantly, a partner in getting my message of helping students across the world. Because Howard Davies not only wrote the foreword for my book Racing Towards Excellence, which basically ensured its success because he was the director of the LSE, he was the chair of uh, the Man Booker Prize at the time, he was on the board of Morgan Stanley, the International, and before that he'd been a um, deputy governor of the Bank of England. So with that CV and him writing the foreword of the book, it really you know, helped cement the book's identity and its credibility, for which I'll be very grateful. But then he also supported me by you know, helping to really allow me to come to the LSC, mentor students, help the AIC alternative investment conference grow here. He was a visionary because he truly believed that the best way for students to excel at the LSE was when students helped each other. So he really promoted student societies and gave them all the support that they needed so that they could help other students. So his so even after he left LSE, his devotion to the LSE definitely inspires me to come back every year and continue to help LSE students. Thank you, Ms. Khan, for your time in explaining these concepts and giving this valuable advice to me as well as all of us here and those people who are watching the video right now. Thank you.